Every year, new people come here and hear the Thanksgiving message, and they learn things they don't want to know, like what was actually on the menu. This painting is from the um, 1800s there, and the Indians are dressed up like Plains Indians, not like the Wampanoags, or I forget what uh, Squanto was. And, um, but he comes from that big tribe of the Wampanoags. That, and the, uh, the pilgrims aren't quite dressed properly either. And they, the pilgrims were not actually Puritans. They were uh, very colorful dress, dressers. They dressed in all kinds of uh, purples and reds and they liked colors and they ran around with pretty flashy clothing to be honest. Um, so anyways, we'll have fun today as we look at this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have a chance to uh, remember uh, the thanksgiving via the pilgrims. And it just gives us a whole chance to remember who you are and what giving thanks is all about. And uh, we just ask that that would get deep in our hearts today and kind of uh, be the root of what this holiday is. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we gave Zach a tricky uh, Thessalonians verse, I should have thought about that before I did <laughs> uh, the power verse. But be thankful in all circumstances. And um, as Drew pointed out so well, circumstances should not change who you are inside. Does that make sense? I mean, so often we're excited and happy depending on what is happening right in front of us. Like if you were watching the Ohio State game yesterday, you weren't really being all that thankful, were you? I mean, like grateful, excited. I mean, if you're an Ohio State fan or whoever your favorite team is, when they get into a tight game, you're like, oh, this is, this is stressful. And, you know, I, I think part of it's just my age, but I've really reached a point, because I'll tell you what, when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was thinking about watching football during church. I mean, I'm the pastor. <laughs> and I'm looking at the clock going, okay, we got to get this message over with, baby, <laughs> so we can go see some football. And I've gotten to the point in my life now where, you know, I, I enjoy watching football, but whatever. And even the teams that I really root for and cheer for, it's whatever. You know, if we win, great. If we lose, I'm not going to lose one second of my joy. Amen? I'm not losing one second of my joy. I'm not losing my thankful heart for all the good and great and wonderful things that I have in my life. Maybe it's because I went through the battle with cancer. Maybe that changed me some. But I think I changed even before that. Um, the, the story of Thanksgiving goes back way, way, way back to um, the Reformation and Martin Luther. And uh, actually next year, uh, I think it's 500 years since uh, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the Wittenberg door. And... And when he nailed those 95 theses up, they, they were complaints. They were, um, they were points of uh, where he was saying, I really think these are bad things that the Catholic Church is doing, and we need to rectify them. We need to change them. We need to get, we need to get right with God. Because, and his major complaint was that the Catholic Church was selling what they called indulgences. And so you could pre-buy yourself or you could buy a, a relative that already passed away out of uh, purgatory, out of pre-hell, so to speak, by paying the Catholic Church money. So it was, it was convenient, you know, kind of, if you kind of knew you were going to the bad place, you know, you just give them 10, 20,000, you're going to be okay. And, you know, of course, this, is, this was a horrible practice. This was a terrible thing that the Catholic Church was doing, and it had nothing to do with Christianity. It had to do with a bunch of greedy men who wanted money. And so 
Martin Luther didn't want to lead the Catholic Church. He just wanted them to stop doing bad stuff. But as it came down to it, finally we ended up with what we call the Protestant Reformation protest. He was protesting, right? He nailed these things up and said, we're doing stuff the wrong way. We've got to do stuff the right way. And um, so we ended up with the Protestant Reformation and the, you know, the Lutheran Church, the Baptists, and all these different churches. But the Church of England did not leave right away. And uh, it's kind of interesting. It turns into a, a big soap opera. The, the reason, because the, the, the English were part of the Catholic Church. And the reason they left was, and I got to kind of look at my notes here. So uh, Henry VIII, uh, he was not really for religious inform until Catherine of Aragon, his first wife, she did not give him a male heir to the throne. And so he got frustrated and he applied to the Pope for an annulment of his marriage because he wanted to marry somebody else so he could get a male heir, all right? The problem was the Pope was really connected to uh, Charles V, who was the emperor of an empire down there in Europe, and it was his niece that was married to Henry. And so he had problems there. He couldn't annul him because he'd offend this big king in his kingdom. So he wouldn't do it. So Henry's response was, to heck with the Catholic Church. We'll start our own church. And so he started the, Eng the England Church of England, the Anglican Church, and he grabbed all the stuff that belonged to the Catholics. He usurped all their land and their money and punted all the you know, cardinals and bishops and those guys out. And so, boom, Church of England, Protestant. wasn't really Protestant. And there's a lot, well, I don't want to go too deep into this. If you want to go really deep in this, go to my message. You can watch the video three years ago and you can get the whole soap opera. But there's a lot more to it. But in the end, what happens is we have this situation where the people who really wanted to worship God, the, the real Protestants are still out there and they don't like, they're being told how to worship God. And you got to do it this way. And this is the only form that it can be done. And they were, because the church was doing things by the church's rules, not by the Bible's instructions. And they just wanted to do everything by the Bible. And they also believed in the thing that Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther had two things, do things by the Bible and justification by faith. In other words, the only way to be saved was by believing in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross. You couldn't work your way into heaven. You couldn't buy your way into heaven. So as there developed a group of people um, called Puritans, and the Puritans, um, as we know them, are people who dress in black and white, right, and have really strict rules. That's what we think of Puritans. But the Puritans was really a pejorative term developed by the clergy of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, to say, oh, you know, those idiots that want to do everything by the Bible. So I would be a Puritan because <laughs> I want to do everything by the Bible. I think that's our source. I think that's where we should get our truth. That's our, you know, our manual for how to live life. Uh, so that's what Puritans were, and it was really, you know, they were, it was a slanderous name that they were assigned. And then among the Puritans, there were two different groups. There was um, a group that wanted to stay inside the English church and change it from the inside. And then there was another group that said, we've been trying to change these guys from the inside for a long time, and we're not getting anywhere, and they wanted to separate so we get the separatist. And that's who the pilgrims were. They were separatists. They said, we want to get out of this system. We're tired of working in the system. And it's not getting us anywhere. And there were actually covert congregations hiding out in England and worshiping the way they thought they should worship. But then they began to be persecuted. And uh, there was a lot of them put in prison for worshiping the way they thought they should worship. 
And that's how the people we know as the pilgrims ended up in Holland. They were trying to flee the persecution, and so they decided they'd go to Holland and they'd worship over there. And um, they found out Holland wasn't heaven. And Holland was kind of, in their opinion, was very uh, worldly. And they started experiencing that their kids were getting sucked into bad things and, and bad behaviors. And, and so they didn't like it. And uh, they were actually uh, uh, having to do very menial jobs just to get a job. I mean, they were doing them. But in England, they were fairly well off. But here in Holland, they were hurting. And so they started saying, hey, we got to do something and get out of uh, these circumstances. So they started tossing around the idea of uh, going to America. And they, they thought about this when they went to America, and they were, they were worried about a lot of things. Um, the major part of the congregation, they, they eventually came together and said, yes, okay, let's do it. But they knew it was going to be a problem. They knew they had a long voyage. They knew they had to, to go and plant crops that weren't going to give fruit right away. So there was going to be problems with starvation. And um, they knew that uh, there were uh, Native Americans there, Indians as they were being called, that were going to be uh, a problem for them. And so all this stuff was going on. They knew that they were not going into an easy situation, but I don't think they realized how bad it was going to be. So they loaded up, and by the time they lose the speed well, they've got 102 people, and uh, they're basically inside a ship, and it's about the size of a volleyball court. So if we stood, let's see maybe about right here, and all of us that are in here, we just have to move into that section right there with our, don't forget, you have to have your chickens and your goats. And the ceiling is five feet high. That's, how many of you could stand up you couldn't. Okay. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was in this home one time. I need to make an emergency phone call on the phone. And I went into their kitchen. And when I got to the one side of the kitchen, my head was, I stepped in the door. Their ceiling was touching my head. And the telephone was over there. And it sloped that way. I'm going over, you know. <laughs> it's really weird. It was really eerie. I cannot imagine spending two months. You know how many times I would hit my head on the big beams, right? The ceiling is five feet. So remember, the beams are going to be, you'd hear, what would you hear all the time? Thunk. Thank God. <laughs> right? <laughs> Isn't that what you say when you hit your head? Boom! Praise God! I've got, I, you know, I'm de I usually, if I get hurt, I say, ow. If I get hurt really bad, you'll hear me say, ow, ow. If something's falling off, you know, I'll keep saying, ow. <laughs> Here they are, trapped in this tiny place with 102 people, children, babies, crying, no restrooms, all they got are chamber pots. You got animals in there. Nobody can wash their clothes. The ship is going like this. Everybody is sick or, you know. Oh, for two months. And when they get there, when they get to, oh, here's the picture of a ship. That's actually a photograph of the Mayflower. <laughs> When they get there, they're in the wrong place. The captain has missed the Hudson Valley, and he's hit Massachusetts. 
And they tried to swing around Massachusetts, but the shoals in there, the reefs are too much for them, and they're tired anyways, and they said, just go back. So they go back inside the Cape Cod Bay there, and they hit uh, Plymouth. They land there allegedly next to a big rock, although that's kind of a possibility that's true, but we're not sure. They land at Plymouth. They, they are having to wade ashore about a mile through waist-high freezing seawater. They're dying sometimes two to three a day. The, it's just these horrible circumstances. They get on shore and they find a place to build and there's actually a few good things that have happened uh, from their perspective, not from the Native Americans' perspective. The Native Americans have been wiped out from disease by the tens of thousands. And literally, they just died where they were standing or laying. And nobody's even tried to bury them. There were just too many. And the people that live fled to some other place to try to find other, you know, Native Americans that were the same tribe as them that they could live with. And so they were able to move into some of these situations and appropriate some of their food that was left. And... But besides a little bit of that that they found, they're really hurting. It's December. Um, it's cold. They try to build huts out of saplings and, and mud and thatch roofs. They keep burning down because they've got a fire inside. You get a few sparks going. <laughs> house burns down. Uh, half of them die. Half of them die. When they come back around to the, the spring, Squanto shows up and uh, Bradford, the, govern, the guy who ends up being their governor, Governor William Bradford, he says, this was like God sent us Squanto. Of course, Squanto's name meant demon of darkness, but just kind of let that go. Okay. Um, I, th I think it's a great thing. God can work all things for the good. Amen. Here's a guy who's, who, because he didn't name himself, right? His parents name him Prince of Darkness or Demon of Darkness or whatever. He ends up becoming a Christian. So was he transform, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light? Yeah. Did God use him to help the pilgrims survive? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a cool story. Um, so they end up in this situation and they, they plant and they took some of that food they found and he taught them how to plant corn and they planted corn and he told them how to fish and he told them how to find eels. It was one of the biggest celebrations that they had when he showed them how to dig with, with, for eels with his feet. He would get into the mud, he would start tromping and stomping in the mud, grab feet with, grab the eels with his toes, pull them out and then showed them how to eat them. And they said, boy, that was good eating. So this Thanksgiving, you guys go down to the lake shore, start stomping around the mud to get himself some eels, and you can have an authentic Thanksgiving meal. So they're, so they're snagging the eels, and they were, uh, they were hunting. And as it turns out, um, they may have had turkeys. They may have had turkeys at the first Thanksgiving meal, but... Probably not because they didn't, they were trying to shoot things with ball and musket. And they described turkeys, they hadn't seen roadrunners, but the basic description of a turkey was a roadrunner. They said, you can't hit those things. <laughs> they would run through the woods, you know, and you're trying to shoot them with, they were trying to shoot with a gun that was so heavy it had a stick out in the front with a little Y and you would set it in there because they couldn't hold the, have you ever seen a big gun like that? I remember when I was a teenager, my, uh, Uncle, I was probably 12 or 13, he brought a big musket and we were down at the tree farm. He said, here, shoot this, you know, and I'm aiming it like this. So we got a step ladder. That's the kind of gun they're shooting. So they couldn't hit these dumb turkeys because they couldn't aim well enough with the heavy guns. But they probably got a few and the Indians were good at bow shooting and they probably, they probably got some also. So the, they're in this situation and it finally works out that things are looking pretty good. And uh, 
the, the pilgrims were really different than us. They, they had a lot of uh, things going on that we would be, we would kind of wonder about. Like, uh, they, they debated whether they should outlaw the celebration of Christmas. <laughs> they, they wanted to banish the Quakers. <laughs> they didn't like the Quakers. You know. Banish them. Um, they wanted to put men in the stocks when they proposed to their daughters without permission. I like that. <laughs> so here's everything we know about the first Thanksgiving. Really, no. It's this one little paragraph. Our harvest being gotten in, our governor sent four men on fowling that so we might, after a more special manner, rejoice together after we had gathered the fruit of our labors, the, they four in one day killed as much fowl as with a little help besides served the company almost a week, at which time amongst the other recreations, we exercised our arms, so they shot their guns, many of the Indians coming amongst us, and among the rest, their greatest king, Massasoit, was some 90 men whom for three days we entertained and feasted. And they went out and killed five deer, which they brought to the plantation and bestowed on our governor upon the captain and others. That's all we know. And from that we have, uh, what, pumpkin pie, <laughs> turkey, stuffing, mashed potatoes. And uh, I don't actually have the list here for you of what, well, it's in your thing. Look in your thing. You can see the list of the actual meal on page six. Wild turkeys, eagles, boy, would they be in trouble now. <laughs> Pigeons, partridges, geese, ducks, swans. They thought swans were a delicacy. Herons, cranes, venison, deer meat. Fresh fish, mussels, clams, lobsters, eels. Indian corn, collard greens, parsnips, turnips, carrots, onions, spinach, and cabbage. So for those of you that want to be authentic Thanksgiving Americans, there's your menu for Thursday and Friday and Saturday and Sunday. I don't know if you're like me, we have Thanksgiving all weekend long. What really, what we really have to think about here, I think, look back in your little booklet there on uh, page five. Because when you look back on what happened, I think this quote from Willie Bradford is so powerful. He wrote, and this is many years after the fact, he wrote, it was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be enterprised and overcome with answerable courages. That's a great lesson for everybody on this planet. If you wanna do something great in life, it's not going to be easy. You've got to be ready that things are going to be hard. Things are going to be difficult. People are, you're going to think they're with you and then they're not going to be with you. You're going to think that um, this is going to work out the way you want it to and a door is going to shut in your face. Things are going to change in life, amen? And everything's kind of going the right direction and all of a sudden, bam, you're like, whoa, whoa. It was granted that the dangers were great, but not desperate. The difficulties were many, but not invincible, including hamper-scented candles. <laughs> and all of them, through the help of God, by fortitude and patience, might either be born or overcome. So what are the two things that you, that you did when you came up to a problem? You just bore it. You just say, okay, like when you're going across in the ship, what are you going to do? You're just going to survive. And that's where my great little phrase comes from. I can do anything for another hour. I can do anything for another day. I can do another thing for five minutes. Maybe you get down like I was a couple of times going, okay, I can do this for another 10 seconds. You can get in some really hard spots in life, can't you? 
So you just say, okay, I'm going to bear it. And then the other ones, you do what? You overcome it. You figure out, how can I beat this thing? How can I win? How can I turn this for the good? How can we invoke the kingdom into this? Their ends were good and honorable. Their calling lawful and urgent. And therefore, they might expect the blessing of God in their proceeding. Yea, though they should lose their lives in this action, yet they might have comfort in the same, and their endeavors would be honorable. And they had an, an honorable mission. They did want to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They did want to worship God according to Scripture. They wanted to follow the Bible. They wanted religious freedom, not for the sake of doing whatever they wanted. They wanted freedom so they could obey God. That's a really profound thought. Freedom to what? Obey God. Not do whatever you want. What, that's how we think of freedom now, isn't it? I want my freedom. I want to do whatever I want to do. But what the pilgrims exemplified was, okay, we want freedom so we can obey God. And I encourage you in that. Let's be obedient to God. And let's give thanks even when things are going wrong. Can you imagine if, uh, if your family was going to have a Thanksgiving and you said, wow, let's celebrate. You know, only half of our family died this year. You think you might get a little kickback on that? Might get a little flack? Are you out of your mind? They celebrated and gave thanks even though they lost half their people. Can you imagine going over? I think they went over with, uh, I can't remember, 16 or 18 couples, and only three of them were intact couples by the spring. I mean, wow. We think life is tough, right? Think about that. And they still chose to give thanks, and they still chose to be grateful, and they still chose to not quit on God. I think a lot of people, if they had that kind of situation, would just quit on God. If we're half dead, that's over. We're out of here. So I just encourage you, you know, look at all the good that God's put in your life. We, man, we live in a fallen world. It's a hard place to live. And sometimes it's a hard place to die. But the good news is, if you have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to live as Christ, to die is gain. And that's what they understood. They knew that the people they lost were in heaven. And so what did they do? They celebrated. Yeah, they missed them. They want them back. We all want people that we've lost back because there's a big empty spot where they're missing from. Right? But my dad's in heaven. Is there any, my dad have any problems? Nope. My dad's good. Perfect might be the way to describe it. Paradise might be a way to describe it. Where are we going someday? Paradise. Amen? If Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us. You love us so much that you gave your son to die for us. And we are thankful. We are grateful. We pour out thanksgiving to you. Father, we thank you that you have blessed us and we live in a place where we really don't come to that much harm like maybe those that are Christians that are being slaughtered by ISIS, or like Christians who are in China that are, that are oppressed in many other places in this world. Father, places where Christianity, if you tell somebody else about Christ, you go to prison. But we do know that people are having hard times here, Father. And we just ask that you would bless and touch and encourage. Father, where, where we just have to bear it and be patient and deal with it, we ask for that courage. Father, where there's things where we can overcome it, we ask that we would not just sit there 
and whine and moan and pout and be sorry for ourselves, but we would get up and do something. That we would rise to the occasion through the power of your Holy Spirit, through the encouragement of your Son. Because we see what Jesus did. He saw what the cross was going to cost, but your word says he looked through that. He looked through the pain of the cross to see what it was going to produce. And he chose to go to that cross for us. And Father, we ask for that same kind of courage that we could see that there's some hard things out there in front of us and there's, there's some pain and there's some struggle, but there's a goal that we got to get to. And there's something that you want us to accomplish and we choose to work at that. We choose to, to produce for your kingdom and for your people. And we pray this prayer and people who are serious about it said amen in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Okay, he, he really is. And so if you're going through something hard, though, we really do want to pray for you because God does answer prayer and he does work today. Amen. Amen. And he changes things. So if you need prayer, come up over here. There'll be people to pray for you. If you've got any questions you want to ask me about anything, the message or anything else, I'll be over here to answer questions. We'd be glad to do that. Lift your hands. Receive the blessing. Father, we just ask that we would just have such a heart of thanksgiving, Father, that uh, when we see difficulties, we just see them as opportunities, that we just be filled with joy because we know you're helping us get through every single one of them. Just give us a great attitude this Thanksgiving week, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. amen. We love you. Have the best Thanksgiving of your life so far. <laughs>